guest today, Dr. Zeus Leonardo. Uh, welcome, Zeus, to this Faculty of Education, to this University, to the city of Regina, this province of Saskatchewan, and to Canada itself. And I note with respect, uh, as is customary, that we are on Treaty 4 land. And given our university's uh, infamous now cheerleading team's costume scandal of last weekend, your visit is more than just timely. It's apparent to all of us, as uh, Dr. Spooner reminded me, that there's still much work for all of us to do. Zeus Leonardo has a BA in English, like I do, and a PhD in education from UCLA. My uh, degrees are not from UCLA. But He's an associate professor in social and cultural studies and education at the University of California, Berkeley. Some of his essays include The Souls of White Folk, Critical Social Theory and Transformative Knowledge, The Unhappy Marriage Between Marxism and Race Critique. And some of his books include Race, Whiteness and Education, 2009, which I just finished reading, uh, Handbook of Cultural Politics and Education, 2010, Education and Racism, a Primer on Issues and Dilemmas, 2013, and a soon-to-be-released Critical Frameworks on Race and Education. And so, what's important about bringing Dr. Leonardo here today to the University of Regina? I think, among other things, it's important that we understand that uh, when we invite people into our space, and they share with us what they know and have learned from their own experience, it helps us to see ourselves in a, in a new way. More clearly, perhaps, uh, to understand how we have come to be who we are and how we find ourselves in our own particular construction of reality. Dr. Leonardo speaks with clarity and authority on the lived reality of racism and its many forms, historical and contemporary, in the United States of America. From my reading of Leonardo's work, I have learned much. His advice to know our histories so we can know how and why racism still works is critical for teacher education and society. He advocates for all of us to engage in frank discussions about how racism and white privilege are grounded not just in theory, but in practice and in discourses. And he does so uh, as he does this teaching in the Graduate School of Education at the University. He wisely counsels to move beyond mere empathy and to participate in careful analysis based on reason. I think this is germane and important. His suggestion that we begin to understand positionality not just as ourselves as individuals, but as subjects and objects of structures embedded in power is again, I would suggest, most timely for us here in Saskatchewan today. <coughs> Now, of course, the history of the United States is quite different from our own, but all of North and South America has been fundamentally defined by colonial, neo-colonial, and capitalist experiences that we have inherited. They have helped to define who we are. And it is this inheritance that makes us accountable. Through my own white privilege, I just returned from a happy holiday in Mexico in a city called San Miguel de Allende, where the layers of colonialism and racism continue to be embodied it is a city full of, literally, Catholic cathedrals and churches on every other street corner. And uh, there, because of the result of the Spanish conquest and their lust for uh, silver. And today, of course, Mexico is still living with further intrusions of whiteness in the form of Walmart and Costco and McDonald's. And many, many gringos, like myself, attracted to Mexico by the climate and inexpensive living. While I was there, I read the Governor General award-winning novel, The Arenda, by Métis author Joseph Boyden, about the attempts of the French Jesuits in the 17th century to live among the Huron peoples and convert them, only to be massacred by their Iroquois enemies. Massacred because, of course, the Iroquois were allies of the English. And that both the French and the English had many mistaken assumptions about Les Sauvages, as they were called, as, uh, assuming that they were not deeply spiritual peoples. Dr. Leonardo is very correct that we ignore our past at our peril. So all of us being treaty people in part of a, is part of a much bigger, more complex, layered, complicated understanding of our reality. Just as the blockade today in southern Ontario by uh, members of the Mohawk Nation to raise consciousness for the many thousands of missing, assaulted, and murdered Aboriginal women 
in this country is part of that larger complexity that uh, Dr. Leonardo addresses. And it's interesting, of course, that the story of the blockade is reported as providing or uh, provoking an inconvenience to those who had to get off a train and get on a bus to get where they were going, and not about the issues that were being raised. Zeus Leonardo has written, among other things, about the racism and white privilege structurally embedded in the No Child Left Behind initiative of the Bush administration in the United States. I would suggest that the recent lean initiative of our own provincial government referenced in today's budget speech from the legislature, and specifically its mandate under the rubric of students first would benefit from the critical analysis provided by Dr. Leonardo and others, if only to ask for whom are these initiatives intended and who will benefit and why is the concept of racelessness very much part of the discourse of economic growth and its link to student achievement and standardized testing. Finally, I want to thank Dr. Leonardo's parents, I think, for giving him the wonderful first name Zeus. <laughs> As the first god of the Greek pantheon, Zeus crossed and joined the worlds of the mortal and the immortal, of the human and the supernatural. Such a span of knowing and the possession of such cosmic view is awe-inspiring. I can only think that your parents, Zeus, must have been people who were very idealistic and optimistic, both about for you and for the world at large that we all aspire to take on such knowledge with such power as Zeus the Greek God did is part of our hope for humanity and it is a story told over and over and over across all times and cultures. Knowing how race really works on many levels, personally, deliberately, unconsciously, systematically, insidiously, historically, structurally, might even help us, Dr. Leonardo concludes, to be better educators and better human beings. So in closing, I'd like to thank all those faculty and staff who have worked uh, hard to make the, event, the events of the next few days happen, particularly Mark Spooner, who acted as a catalyst and uh, supported by Mike Capello and Patrick Lewis, pushed us uh, in these tough economic times to proceed with this, uh, what will be, I'm sure, a gift. So please join me in a warm welcome to our guests this afternoon. Dr. <laughs> Thank you. 
So what I want to talk to you about today, this title may look a little different from the advertised title, only because everyone who is an author knows that uh, things change along the way uh, in the months that we write these papers. So I'm trying to, uh, I'm titling this one, uh, not What's Race Got to Do With It? Of course, of course, What's Race Got to Do With It? is an homage to, right, the singer Tina Turner, right? And if you've attended a different talk, I might have done homage to Prince, the singer from Minnesota. Uh, as I have. But uh, this one is rewriting race, um, and I'm looking at and studying the works of Charles Mills, the philosopher, and his book, The Racial Contract of 1997 and on, because he still uses it as a methodology, and uh, of course how critical race education is part of um, how I understand the, the work I do. So um, I'm going to start, okay? So good afternoon, and uh, there's a Q and A I believe that follows this, and we'll we'll carry on uh, dialogue and stuff. So these slides are really just there as a roadmap. Okay. It's okay. That's what fingers are for. So, okay, so those are the four parts of the talk that I'm going to um, lay out today. So Charles Mills is, again, a philosopher, um, originally trained as an analytic Marxist in, actually, Canada, I believe, Toronto, right? Toronto. Um, and I, I signal that just to say that the, the, the intellectual road is not straight, right? And so where you might find yourself later, um, is not where you began. And so he's certainly trained as an analytical Marxist, but in some ways uh, turns his attention to race as his organizing principle. So let me, let, me, let me begin here. In critical race theory in education, the methodological focus unarguably falls on what is called counter storytelling, right? A mode of research that speaks back, is, is there a feedback? to white majoritarian narrative lines of understanding. So counter storytelling is, first of all, suggesting that what we know is already a storyline, a majority storyline told from the perspective of Eurocentrism or whiteness, and countering that is offering another story from the perspective of minorities. So for this talk, I turn to Charles Mill's notion of the racial contract as a methodology to generate insights on how race in particular people of color are written into law and history in document form as well as into common sense. So the racial contract functions on at least two levels. It is literal. We have documents. We already spoke about treaties a minute ago. Right? So the racial contract is written. But it is also a common sense. Right? So that the racial contract is also a metaphor or a mechanism through which we may think about the world. So this is the common sense that takes the spirit of the contract as its assumptive form. In short, what can we offer today about understanding Mill's framework for education, policy, etc.? As such, I'm arguing that education is itself a form of racial contract that writes children and students of color into a subjecthood that positions them as the cursed share, right? The cursed share of the general racial contract. So, Part of this argument is that there's the general racial contract and it has subparts to it, right? And so the subparts I'm going to be talking about are the spatial subcontract, the epistemological, and the cognitive educational subcontract. And if I have time, I'll also try to provoke you to think about what it, why, what it, what it might mean to sign off the contract. What I'm calling in the literature as the literature on the abolition of whiteness. Itself a species of the, con uh, the concept of signing off. So, epistemologically, ontologically, and existentially, students of color are written into this contract as subpersons, where they function as alibis for the provision that whites are already persons, a principle that is parasitic on personhood of color. Now, you have to um, also um, allow me the luxury of speaking from an American perspective. So some of the words I'm using may not be exactly the same as the terminologies you would use. So for example, in the US, we say person of color or people of color. 
So here I'm going to present the, uh, the main terms of this contract as they appear in these subcontracts. And it is important to keep in mind that these subcontracts are by no means separate and represent analytical moments of the main contract. And then finally, I try to add with some of the racial contracts gaps, right, to determine the possibility of its own demise, right, to determine the possibility of the race contract's own demise, which requires the act of signing off from its terms. That is, I sketch some ideas about ways to counteract, i.e. counterwrite, the racial contract as part of a corrective to the history that interpolates or hails us as people of color and its targets. But here, both whites and people of color have a stake in the rewriting of the contract, where in the end, we are imagined as neither black nor white, but free. And in education, uh, well, if you're familiar with the white abolitionist movement of uh, Rodiger, Ignatius, Garvey, um, they, they have a magazine and a website called Race Trader. Um, without making too long of a story around that, Race Trader was originally a sort of an epithet by whites about whites who were cozying up too closely to people of color, that these whites were race traders. Well, these new whites, these white abolitionists, are asking whites to be race traders, i.e., right, to sign off the, the white contract. So they're using race trader in a kind of ironic twist. In education, I might call this the epistemological trader. So let me begin. I'm not going to read it because we all know how to read, so I'm just going to continue my talk as you peruse through that. Okay? So Charles Mill's philosophy of the racial contract, henceforth, let me call it RC, begins with his engagement of mainstream social contract theory in philosophical discourse. Now, while he does not reject the notion of the social contract as, an, as a principle, he does not accept its speculative form, its abstract form, right, that projects an ideal world among whites at the detriment of people of color, specifically Charles Mills is talking about blacks, but I think we can broaden that notion to include other people of color. In other words, the social contract describes a world written by and for whites in terms that respect their rights and standing. Although working class and other marked whites, such as women, and that gets us a little bit into the recent episode because one thing I, was try I, I noticed that I'm not noticing on the postings about uh, the cheerleading uh, episode is that they are not just white, they're women. And so without going too far into that, I'm suggesting that there are um, white identified folks who themselves suffer, suffer certain injuries, for example, working class, right? White women, gay and lesbian whites, etc. So it, it's, it's complicated if we think about that. So although working class and other marked whites, such as women, admittedly share the minimal returns of whiteness, as presumed, per as presumed persons, so, so this is a theory of person. As presumed persons, they are nonetheless benefactors of the RC within its discursive ontology, its understanding. In this, Mills accomplishes a move no less significant than Marxist materialism with respect to the problems of Hegelian idealism. For, for those who, who, don't, who are not familiar with that, right, Hegel was an idealist, a religious philosopher, who thought that the world was about ideas, and Marx says he was on his head, and our job was to put him back on his materialist feet. So what Mills is doing is something similar. He's putting the social contract theory, which is currently on its head, on its racial feet. We are reminded, again, of Marx's thesis of the Camera Obscura, wherein a certain inversion of the actual world takes place in idealist philosophy, like Hegel's, which then has to be put back onto its materialist feet. Regarding social contract theory and its cousin, white ignorance, Mills writes, quote, obviously such a starting point crucially handicaps any realistic social epistemology, since in effect it turns things upside down, close quote. So Mills's explication of the RC is the attempt to put the racial heavens back in order, to write people of color back into existence. Mills's framework is a materialist counterpoint to the tradition of idealist social contract theory. 
that perceives of a literal and be codified in laws and policies. Right? So remember, it works on at least two levels. The literal and then symbolic, i.e. embedded in co common sense, agreement that at best obscures the inner workings of racism, or at least, or at worst, is the central apparatus that makes it possible. More to the point, Mills's materialism is a form of what I'm calling corporealism, just to distinguish it a little bit from Marxism, that differs from Marxist economic determinism insofar as race is what Mills understands as a system of body politics, functioning under what he calls a Caucasoid somatic norm. A Caucasoid somatic norm. Right? That's where my corporealism that I attach to it comes from, that it's a theory of bodies. That is not unlike Franz Fanon's version of corporeal materialism as an antidote to historical materialism, right? Mills stretches, this is a word that Fanon uses, Mills stretches Marx's economic theory to account for what he called the epidermalization, right? Epidermalization of the economic relation. So how the economic relation is racialized, how it's epidermalized. The philosophy, Mills's philosophy, is a form of hard-headed realism. Or as Mills simply states, quote, if you start with this, you will end up with that, close quote. It is radical as a politic, but actually conservative as a methodology, as it puts forth a social epistemology grounded on the assertion of a true world. So he's not, he's not with the constructivist on this one. He believes there is a true world that one can find out. So his politics is racially radical, his methodology is actually conservative. And that this assertion of a true world is, is disfigured by the social contract, is disfigured by the social contract, distorted. As such, Mills affirms the tradition of demystification so central to critical theory from Marxism and on, this time at the service of racial analysis. Right? For Mills, the RC is more indicative of the actual world we live in, rather than a, a, a conjectural situation put forth by idealist social contractors. So he's saying he, there are advantages to the racial contract idea because it explains the actual world we live in, rather than the idealized world that appears in social contract theory. And if that's not ideal, I, if it's real, it's only real for whites. So there is his claim, and I, so I won't read it since you've already looked at it. Okay? The RC is real and not a projected theory of this ideal society. It is what actually exists. Inasmuch as the RC is a theory, it is not a form of what Althusser once called theoreticism. Right? It's not a theory that is at the level of only ideas, but a scientific theory of the existing society and its logical consequences. If you do this, you get that. Which Mills calls the system of white supremacy. Okay. Now, a second on this terminology. White supremacy is not a nice word, right? I'm not saying I recommend you go to your meetings talking about it. That's your decision and that's the context you need to navigate, right? I don't necessarily go to my faculty meetings talking about white supremacy. It's not a nice word, but neither is it describing a nice process. So I think the advantage of talking about white supremacy where we can and I'm, I'm allowing myself some luxury to talk about it that way, is that at the, level of, at the level of terminology, it has certain advantages. There is no such thing as brown supremacy. There is no such thing as red supremacy. There is no such thing as yellow supremacy. Right? So even if we allow ourselves to talk about that there is such thing as a black racist attitude, there is such a thing as yellow to black racial enemies, there is no such thing as black supremacy, et cetera. It's not a nice word, but it's also because it's not describing a nice process. Mills's racial contract theory benefits educational scholarship insofar as it provides a framework for understanding a nefarious and existing agreement. Remember, the racial contract is an agreement that drives how students of color enter the educational plot. This has certain advantages, including a description of how people of color are included that is, written into rather than out of the racial contract. So this is not actually a framework for examining how people of color are excluded for something. 
from something. That happens too. But this is actually trying to explain how we are included in the racial contract, in the cursed share of it, the cursed portion of it. So what are these moments in the larger racial contract? The first one I want to talk about, which I think is already germane as we talk about the treaty, is questions of land right, and space. So a facet of the RC is the partitioning of the social world into quote unquote light and dark spaces. This process happens literally through colonization and other crimes against racialized peoples, as well as through the semiotic, I mean the meaning system, by attaching differential meanings among them. Simple. Think of all the positive iterations and meanings of white and compare that with the positive meanings and iterations of black or dark. Right? I've been doing this for years, and I can find many for white, and for black, I can only find a couple, which is, I'm in the black, meaning I have a lot of money. Right? And once I tried to suggest to students that a black tie event is a fancy event, but a smart student said, but a white tie event is even better. Right? So at the level of colonization and material dispossession of the people, but also at the level of meaning. This colonization continues. Through colonization, a spatial demarcation right, is enforced to expropriate lands on one hand and resources for the material advantages and the cultural pleasures of European whites. Cultural pleasures. I think we saw that on display on Monday. Right? Dressing up in cowboy and Indian outfits is the continuation of this, of this dispossession at the level of culture. And I'm not here either as a psychoanalyst, right, or an administrative body to chastise a group of people, some of whom may actually be in this room. I'm here to try to make sense of what's happening and perhaps offer a language to allow us to enter those episodes. So this, de this demarcation cements into policy called the color line, a process described by W.E.B. Du Bois at the turn of the 20th century. This means that when possible, global spaces occupied by non-whites become reimagined as wastelands, in need of being rediscovered by and for European whites. Right, wastelands, there's nothing there. It is important to note that the needs of indigenous or native peoples are not primary in this consideration. Before this moment, these spaces exist as quote-unquote natural places that need to be converted into socio-political territories that are administered by whites. So, right, there's a difference between collectivities and societies and what Europeans thought they found were collectivities that needed to be turned into societies. Under indigenous rule, they are lands or territories which are not the same again as societies to the European mindset. By contradistinction, savages are not human, at least in the fullest sense of the word, because they are, quote unquote, quote, locked in a different temporality, incapable of self-regulation by morality and law. They are humanoid, but not human, close quote. And their, quote unquote, equality with Europeans would be an oxymoron. As Mills understands it, societies belong only to the European imaginary that constructs them as rationally organized, instrumentally cultivated, and fit for civilization. All else is empty and requires the European hand to realize their potentiality. Now one could say this happened before, but my suggestion is it's still happening. The spatial dimensions of the RC come with multiple levels of violence. They are as disruptive of existing communities or collectivities through displacement as they are of redefining them through incorporation. Right? So displacement is one thing, i.e. ghettoization, or what I uh, earlier alluded to as exclusion, but they are also uh, redefined through incorporation of how people are actually included in the contract. For the RC functions as much through commission as it does through omission. It is not defined solely by its power to exclude, but through its ability to include or write into the contract how non-whites are to be constituted as subjects of this agreement. 
So the suggestion here by Mills is that white Europeans are already socio-political beings. In the eyes of whiteness, I have a lot of things to say about whiteness. Uh, some of you may know my writing on this. In the eyes of whiteness, the spatial reorganization of the world makes the world knowable through military means on one hand, flanked by a cultural apparatus on the other. My suggestion here is that colonization or imperialism is a two-part project. One is military, one is a knowledge project. It is global in scope, necessitating a global theoretical framework for understanding white racism or planetary apartheid, without denying that it takes particular forms right, in local places. It happens differently here than it does in the US. Du Bois predicted as much when he observed that no corner of Earth has been left untouched by whiteness, so establishing a spatial haven for blacks, i.e. recall Liberia, is dogged, is dogged by the reminder that the social contract's reach is immense and appropriates lands that are transformed into the image of whiteness. But here's the irony, is that as part of their ontological makeup, whites later misunderstood their own image and creation, right? So they, they, they create lands after their own image, which they then later misunderstand. They cannot know literally what they have done and still remain white. They cannot know what they have done and still remain white. After, that, that kind of gestures to some of the points I'll bring up later about white abolition, right, or what it means to be white. After we know that it took white Europeans to name, like the Son of God, dark spaces on the globe and bring them literally into existence, a certain racial economy of language practice clarifies the process of non-whites coming into being. As Mill says, quote, the implication is that if no white person has been there, cognition did not take place. Colon, New England, New Holland, New France, in a world, in a world, New Europe's, also New Mexico. Close quote. As an extension, as an extension of the transcendental mind or cogito, idealist social contractarians, a little mouthful, are disembodied bodies, right? The idealist social contractarian is, an, is a disembodied body, occupying space vis-a-vis -vis the surrogate corporeal other. Right? So they're occupying space vis-a-vis -vis the other. In this sense, the mind also, so this is how I'm continuing where Mills may have left off, because he's not talking about this next part. Now, we all know that right, colonization moved from the east to west in the US, right? the western frontier. But it did, my point here in this next part is it, it didn't stop at the Pacific Ocean, right? Because in this sense, the mind also represents the next territory, the next space to be colonized. It is a cognitive space that is full for whites and empty for non-whites, right? So it would have been enough that the that colonization stopped at the Pacific Ocean from the east going west, but it, it didn't stop that. It, continued, it continues to the new territory called the students of color, student of color's mind. It is part of the overall quote unquote conceptual territory discovered by Europeans. Like the land that lays in waste, indigenous people's cognition wallets, and I would add other students of color into that. They cannot convert their fields into an economic industry for profit because their minds are not industrious. This is according to right, the racial contract. Like the limited returns they reap from their natural resources due to unscientific agricultural methods, their inability to reason likewise presents a ceiling to their human flourishing. It would have been enough that Europeans expanded again their conquest to the West. It did not stop there and push to the last frontier of cognitive space. It became a policy of colonizing the mind of others, usually through the violence of education, or its euphemism called reculturation. The, re the creation of the subject of color, i.e. the subject of color, was precisely made by Europe, makes it possible to argue for cultural projects such as education, which treat people of color as tabula rasa, as empty vessels, right? To be filled with white intentions in civilized ways. It is a veritable and verifiable form 
of what Paulo Freire once called banking education, where knowledge is deposited into the account known as minority minds, this time with the added injury of civilizing them. Like the era of exploration claimed non-European spaces already populated with people, and we, I think the irony of that whole description is well rehearsed, non-whites' cognitive space is discovered by whites in order to be populated by white habits of mind through boarding school policies for Native Americans, separate but equal schooling for blacks, and linguistically or culturally irrelevant instruction for Asian and Latino children. The disparagement of racialized others ghettoizes them into what Fanon once called the zone of non-being, an existential space of nothingness undercut by the primary existence of white being. That's a gesture to Jean-Paul Sartre's book, Being and Nothingness. As a spatial metaphor, this zone, of, this zone is contiguous with what Mills calls, quote unquote, sub-personhood, a subject that deserves either sub or non-schooling. Right? So a sub-person deserves sub or non-schooling. Regarding blackness, which Mills is uh, concerned with here, not only does the RC promote the ejection of the black body from white spaces, as evidenced by 100 years of ghettoization since the early decades of the 1900s, such as, but the rejection of everything black. Right? So it's not just the, the ejection of the black body from white spaces, but the rejection of everything black. Unless they serve the commodification of blackness within white capitalism. Right? So you can also talk about how the ejection of everything black is good until it serves white purposes, such as the commodification of, of the black body in hip hop, et cetera. Or, right, I think what we saw in this play the other day. In ghetto schools, the policy of white supremacy accomplishes two related processes. On one hand, it withholds from students of color resources considered by whites necessary for their children. And on the other hand, either denigrates or supplants minorities' cultural worldview to deprive them of their own self-recognition. Okay. I go on, there's much more. I don't think I can probably <laughs> possibly give you all that's here. But let me go on to the epistemological subcontract, the second moment. So again, imperialism is one part military, one part knowledge project, right? Said, Edward Said is clear that Orientalism's cultural mode enables imperialism to become a modern project. It requires the quote unquote gentleness of cultural understanding to supplement the brutality of repressive military power. With respect to the RC, a certain epistemological contradiction is at work. At the same time that whites discover a people and place by making them objects of knowledge, they cannot know what they have created. So this is my previous point, right? and still remain white. And with respect to those who actually know what has transpired, white or non-white, the RC deems them as epistemologically unrecognizable. Right? So for those of you who are calling out right, racist images, racist actions, the irony or the, the paradox you're going to run into is that your ability to reason or your attempt to reason with others that this is going on is going to be judged by the standards of the racial contract that deems you, in, uh, that deems you um, illegible. That's a paradox. So what that means is when folks of color or whites with race consciousness right, were outraged at Monday's event, right? There are equally, if not also more, folks who are going to judge that on the basis of the racial contract. So there are, I, I understand, 44 approvals of the, was it a tweet or a, right? It was a posting. There are 44 approvals of that, according to the you know, 44 likes. So the irony is when you speak against the racial contract, you might as well be speaking in another language, right? Because you are judged by 
right? The discursive understanding of the racial contract. You are unrecognizable. People of color, in this case, literally know too much. Right? In Mills's estimation, the RC is an agreement among whites to misinterpret the world as it is. Right? He goes on in some newer work uh, talking about white ignorance. It's, it's, it's some very provocative work. It is grounded on an epistemology that lacks consistency and defies logic, but cognitively does not produce dissonance because it remains consistent with the RC, right? So we can't even rely on cognitive dissonance here because it's consistent with the racial contract's own understanding. It appears in educational policies, such as No Child Left Behind in the US, which recognize the existence of racial achievement gaps without causally tracing them as logical outcomes of the racial organization of the U.S. as a society. I call it a casual racial analysis versus a causal racial analysis. They happen to be doing worse than whites and Asians. Right? But a causal analysis is they're, they're doing worse because they are black, brown, and native folks in a racialized country. Not, it's not, wait, let me be clear with that. They're not doing worse because they're black and brown. They're doing be worse because they're black and brown in a racialized society that functions under the racial contract. That's the point. And this is a logical consequence. Racial disparities and achievement that are regarded ultimately as un unfortunate, even deplorable conditions are not linked with the opportunity gaps to learn that students of color experience in schools. Yet the epistemological subcontract functions psychologically for whites i.e. maintains their equilibrium, as well as socially, i.e. maintains their white dominance in public life. The machinations and detours of white racial knowledge cannot be underestimated. Right? I like this quote here, and this is Mills talking, right? White ignorance, I, it's, it's too big, do you have enough time? Right? Whereas ignorance used to be on the opposite side of knowledge, right? That's our understanding, philosophically speaking. Knowledge is here, ignorance is on the other side of it. But he asks, within the racial contract, consider and imagine an ignorance that resists, that fights back, that is militant, aggressive, not to be intimidated. An ignorance that is active, dynamic, but refuses to grow quietly. Right? Not about illiterate folks, maybe racially illiterate, and un un uneducated, maybe racially uneducated but propagated at the highest levels of the land, indeed presenting itself unblushingly as knowledge. Thus, on matters related to, he goes on, thus on matters related to race, the race, the RC prescribes for its signatories an inverted epistemology, an epistemology of ignorance, a particular pattern of localized and global cognitive dysfunctions which are psychologically and socially functioned, producing the ironic outcome that whites will, in general, be unable to understand the world they themselves have made. He goes on in other parts of the work to suggest that he's not saying whites couldn't understand this, right? But embedded as they are in the assumptions of the racial contract, it becomes very difficult outside of a fundamental shift in an engagement with the world. What results is a, for, a, formidable, a formidable white ignorance, although not in its classical sense, but in its willful version. Right? For example, if you ask me what Paris was like, I would be ignorant, and anything you tell me, I should be, oh, that's interesting, I didn't know that. I've never been there. But if you've watched The Color of Fear, anybody watch The Color of Fear? Oh, it's a great video. They say it's a little dated now, it's from the 1990s, but. It's a video of nine men who spend, I don't know, a week or so together, in it's filmed. And they talk about race among uh, nine men of different races. And if you, were, if you haven't seen it, then let me give you context. Uh, there's two Davids, I have to say two. Uh, there's Chinese David and there's White David. And White David claims throughout the one and a half hours that he really doesn't know this race relations. But as soon as the people of color, the men of color, tell him what it's about, White David kicks and screams. 
right? If he's ignorant and they're telling him about, about Paris, a place he's never been, why is it that he is so vitriolically against it? It's because, in some sense, it's an ignorance that is willful and his whiteness depends on that ignorance. If you haven't seen it, please, it's, it's a good educational tool to use. Right? So his intent is not to shame whites through a philosophical thrashing, but to expose the structuring effect of racial privilege from white thinking, or for white thinking. No longer just an expression of bad faith, the falsehood of white racial thinking is judged by its consequences rather than its intentions, right? In a biting indictment of white epistemology, Mills writes what he just wrote there. He admits that white, the white and white ignorance does not necessitate that is always a willful thinking confined to whites. To the extent that it is a doxastic, right, it's a daily, everyday common sense condition, it can be, it can be what is called black racial ignorance too which has different consequences for the so-called ignorant person. White ignorance, on the other hand, is a form of morally false knowledge, which is different from your garden variety ignorance. Right? It's different from your garden variety ignorance. The upshot is that whites have created a political system that is near impossible to comprehend rationally and requires whites incoherence. It requires whites incoherence as, and I'll emphasize, as part of their personal and collective development. Okay. In fact, when it comes to race, all those things that are upheld as the dearest tenets of the Enlightenment fall by the wayside. Rationality, autonomous thinking, detachment, intellectual rigor, when white and radical, uh, when, when radical race thought comes into the room and it challenges white's own sense of themselves in the world, these deeply held beliefs in the Enlightenment philosophy, rationality, etc., go by the wayside. And it's not unusual that when push comes to shove, um, many whites rely on irrational, incoherent thought when it comes to issues of race. Whites abandon these principles for unchecked emotion, possessive investment, and group defensiveness, all things they would probably decry when they see it in people of color. They become fond of tautological reasoning and invest in certain policies of absurdity, as in, quote, unquote, we rule the world because we are superior. We are superior because we rule the world, close quote. That's for males. Yet speaking against this illogic, again, is itself evaluated as irrational, according to the RC that judges it, whose discursive structure deems it, again, unrecognizable. People of color might as well be speaking and writing in gibberish. You see this again and again in sociological research. If anybody knows Bonilla Silva's work, right, a sociologist who studies um, at one point, he was studying Detroit workers, right, who were white. He reports at some point in an interview how uh, his, his respondents basically talk incoherently about race. I like to use borrowing from feminism, right, the epistemological standpoint. What I'm trying to understand here is what is the white epistemological standpoint? which I understand is a white set of skills about knowing how, where, and with whom to participate in racial discourse. So against the notion that whites are just simply ignorant about race, my suggestion is whites do know a lot about race. They know when, where, how, and with whom to talk regarding race. It is different from the ability to understand race, right? But it is certainly a form of knowledge, even if it's a mystifying form of knowledge. Now this is relevant to folks in schools because schooling conceives of itself as the knowledge institution. So we see the logical results of the, the RC's epistemological subcontract. Right? I go on and on, I don't think I can say all of it, but I talk about how um, if whites are knowers, then people of color are sub-knowers. Right? If white students are therefore students, 
students of color are therefore sub-students or non-students. I, I get to, I'm trying to use his framework, I'm trying to use his language to bring to bear. So as such, we see that the white students experience an education that is harmonious with their self-knowledge, whereas students of color are alienated from them. Now this doesn't suggest that generally schooling is so interesting for white students too, right? I mean, who wouldn't rather be on their iPhone than read Shakespeare? Right? So one could say, as with the child developmentalists of the earlier parts of 1900s, that schooling was irrelevant for all students and that it needed to be child-centered. I'm not disputing that idea. But for students of color, there's more distance to be traveled, right? right? The latter, for example, I mean, students of color are schooled and have to fight for their right to a real education that is considered in breach of the what I'm calling the educational racial contract or the educational RC. Mills does not underestimate the stakes and warns us that the recent discussions of multiculturalism is welcome. There you go. It's there. I won't read it. So even multiculturalism, which stands as one of the most successful attempts to honor children of color, faces grim prospects if the RC co-ops co -ops it or cap capitalism commodifies it. Because the RC does not recognize people of color as persons, they exist in that netherland, that, that netherland that fails to construct them as children in their youth, i.e. There's a, there's a whole lot of talk that basically, for example, in the Trayvon Martin case, where Trayvon was in the wrong neighborhood in Moshat, right? he was literally a boy, a young boy. Right? But because of this fear of black bodies, right? Right? they don't have the right to be children. Right? And that innocence of children that we like to talk about, that we, that we wish wasn't lost in children, is not afforded to black or children of color. And sometimes, because the word, world out there is itself harsh, black folks have to respond to that. I mean, just imagine, I don't know if you use this phrase here, but, you know, little man. Like, come here, little man, or little man go with me to the store. I mean, the idea of a little man is a young child who, because of the harshness and cruelty of a racialized world, has to grow up faster than a white kid. So the idea of a little man is a boy who has to understand the world as a man. But the other side, too, is that if you've read Ed Ferguson's work, Bad Boys, right? the same behaviors that white kids perform is criminalized when black boys and black kids perform them. So this adultification, adultification of black kids is also happening in schools. But that is a symptom of a larger issue I'm trying to talk about that is social, and it appears in education in this particular form. On the other side, though, we can also say that um, if you isolate some of the literature on black males or black men, they have no right to be men either. So black boys don't have the right to be boys. Black men, because manhood is judged by some criteria that falls into such things as holding down a job, right? And the joblessness of, of many black men make them suspect to be a man. And um, the notion of, of, of being there for your family, right? And so the incarceration rate of black men is very high. And that contributes a lot to single family uh, single parental homes in, in, in black families, right? And so black boys don't have a right to be boys. Black men don't have, seem to have a right to be men either. So they're, they're in that netherland, that inhuman, non-human, subhuman land. Right? So what do we do? So they're in that, they're stuck between the scylla of childhood and the charybdis of adulthood. Right? What do we do? How can we talk about This contract. Let me see how I'm doing in time. All right. So harsh as Mill's message may sound, he does not consider the RC as indefeasible or indomitable, because a contract suggests participation. Right. That's 
That's the idea of a contract. Um, for example, um, we know in the US that most treaties were signed um, by Native Americans. Of course, you can say that coercion right, was right behind that, right? Uh, the, the point here is that because a contract suggests participation by its targets and beneficiaries, like hegemony, it holds out possibilities for disconsenting. Right? So how do we talk about disconsenting to the racial contract? Although common sense compromises even the subalterns, I mean people of color, good sense, they adhere radical sensibilities by virtue of their epistemological standpoint and social experiences. This does not guarantee radicalization as a cognitive inevitability, right? It's not just because you're a person of color, right? Radical thought is inevitable for you. That's not the point. Okay? But suggest that from Marx to feminism, the oppressed are, are able to build oppositional knowledge based on their objective experience with domination. Concerning the dominant class, gender, or in this case, the master race, the situation is admittedly more meanderous. Whereas Lenin, not John Lenin, but the Russian Lenin, whereas Lenin distinguished that the oppressed require education to supplement their radical alterity, the oppressor, i.e. the capitalist, or in this case, the czar, right? the oppressor requires both radicalization and education. That's interesting to me. Right? Whereas Lenin distinguished that the oppressed required education to supplement their already radical experience. The oppressor, master race, master gender, master class, requires both radicalization and education. Whites would need more than information, sensitivity training, etc. I think we can all agree that that is a reasonable requirement in this instance, a reasonable response. But information is not enough. They need a self-reconceptualization, right? Self-reconceptualization. Reconceptualization. In this part, I would like to pose the problem of White's ability to sign off the RC. Okay. I have more thoughts about white abolition than I'm, I've written and I'm thinking about and I'm currently writing about. One thing I'd like to mention is that there's the impression that white abolition is about waiting for what whites are going to do next. That's a dominant impression. That's why Linda Alcoff writes an essay called, What Should Whites Do? Eh, I think that I, I'm asking different questions now because I think white abolition is a project, right? The leader of that project is not clear to me. I understand the goal of the project, which is to abolish whiteness, right? right? We can talk more about that because it sounds awful if you've never heard that phrase before. It's not actually trying to suggest exterminating whites. That's not what it suggests. <laughs> it is trying to exterminate whiteness, which means it makes it impossible for white bodies to think they're white people. It's more complicated than that, but that's its basic definition. Right? But I don't think white abolition is the idea of waiting for whites to do something about their whiteness. That's not my recent understanding. It's equally implicating people of color. In fact, my recent publication suggests that white people ought to be the leaders of white abolition. We can talk more about that later. So Noel Ignatia, Rodiger, and their associates have called this new white subject the race trader, who refuses to honor the dotted line. Right? They have signed on by virtue of whiteness, but they can also refuse to honor that. Amounting to an act of racial sedition, White abolitionists, informed by Marxism and anarchism, argue that a critical mass of whites would need to stop being white. Right? They radically question the RC to which many whites have, sometimes unwittingly, signed on to, as a way to cope with their own social injustices. Remember, earlier I said there are injured whites. Right? They're injured by virtue of gender relations. They're injured by virtue of class relations. They're not injured by virtue of race relations. I want to make that clear. Right. So to the statement that not, uh, not all whites benefit from whiteness, my suggestion is they do. They don't benefit for other, from other things equally. So the, signing on as a way to cope with their social injuries such as class exploitation and patriarchy, whiteness provides them an in, 
at the same time that it's thought of as an out. Right? So injured whites, whiteness provides them an in, as, way as, as well as a way out. In other words, oppressed whites, and I'm, they're not, again, oppressed by their whiteness, we, that's not what I'm saying, but oppressed whites, find their belonging in whiteness and its illusory promise of salvation from non-racial forms of oppression. Right? This is what I'm calling whiteness as bully. Right? When you're being picked on by someone, such as the bully, I'm, I'm, right? Some, sometimes one of the ways that kids handle that is to sort of align themselves with the bully in order to get some protection from, let's say, other bullies. And in some sense, whiteness has become that. Right? Uh, in the case of, for example, what has happened to Jews in the US, right, who suffer from anti-Semitism, one of the explanations by Karen Brodkin Sachs is white, uh, uh, Jews, particularly Jews who look white, found whiteness in the US as some modicum of protection against global, global anti-Semitism. But my, my suggestion is that there's a cost when you line yourself up with a bully. Right? They must pledge their loyalty to the bully called whiteness. And like other bullies, whiteness exacts its price, mainly by exerting its social pressure for denigrated whites. Irish, at the turn of the century, come here and ascend to whiteness. We just had St. Patty's Day on Monday. They have to stay in line and abide by their loyalties to the race in its quest for domination. They carry out the terrorism of whiteness at the same time that they are terrorized by it. Capitulating to the demands and discipline of elite whites, for example. Seeking the protection of the bully, poor whites and white women enter a compromise with whiteness to shield them from the maximum brutalities. Remember, they benefit minimally right, from their whiteness because of gender, because of class. To shield them from the maximum brutalities of capitalism and patriarchy, the RC promises buffer groups who shall bear the breadth of both social systems, race, gender, in exchange for the creation of a third target or system called race relations. Men and women of color serve as the alibi for this sentiment, and a policy of containment means that whiteness as bully requires that people of color become the new object of torment. The rub is that in this new regime, injured whites are not considered equal with property white males. Again, remember that the cheerleaders were, are women, right? There's a double objectification going on there. At the same time, they are objectified as women. In the regime of patriarchy, they do the objectifying of people of color or uh, native Canadians here. So it gets complicated. So women of color here serve as the alibi for the sentiment and a policy of containment means that whiteness as bully requires that people become this new trauma. Um, but they are not equal, not the least bit. For example, maintaining low wages for working class folks and limiting the rights of women, white women, in civil and professional life are evidence of the bully's ability to tighten the rope as it were so that the real lynching may take place. In all but the rare instances in history, this dynamic prevents the margins of whiteness, right? Whites on the margins, to form solidarity with people of color, which would be a breach of the racial contract. They're called race traders. Giving up their milk money to whiteness allows them to avoid direct violence, as long as they agree that a group less worthy than they is more deserving of this violence. Poor whites or white women may be victims in their own right, but they are not idle spectators in this process and are conceived as holding down the real victim. And so they're pictured, pictured as they're holding down the victims as other whites who are calling the shots are um, sort of out of mind, out of sight. Many, if not most whites, sign the RC and do not notice the footnote or fine writing contained in this document, right document, because accruing its general racial benefits in terms of material wages 
and social honor public places is obvious. This does not suggest that they are duped into accepting whiteness, but that signing a contract involves a set of epistemological, spatial, and cognitive dispositions that whites find irresistible, especially in the absence of critical self-reflection. My argument is if white supremacy only benefited rich white men, working class whites and white women would not cling onto whiteness so dearly, and it is too convenient to locate the blame in only the white elite. If it were only the problem of rich white elite, it seems to me it would have been a little more easy to stamp out by now. But my point is, it involves whites from all walks of life. So, anyway, I could go on, but I do want to reserve some time for Q&A because, as you can see, um, I'm into this topic and uh, you can say more. But hopefully I've entered a space where some of this can be opened up for either extension or questions. So thank you again for listening to me and uh, I look forward to this part of it. Thank you. So there's a microphone for questions, and we have some time for that. Um, you can be the brave person to go first on to the microphone. You could ask for a translation. So people of color are dispossessed and dishonored. In fact, what you probably saw is a, better, a good example of being dishonored. How the cheerleaders were dishonoring people of color, even if they were not intending it. And, but I think it, to, to focus too much, I think it's a problem, but it's the tails of a problem. And we have to remember that there's the heads of the coin, which attitudes and conduct are one thing, but continuing policies right, that enable this to happen and policies that don't intervene. And so I hope there is some discussion around that uh, resulting from this. Also transcends the localized understanding of it as, as an insensitivity, right? And that if only they knew ahead of time that this would offend. But I think the offense is larger than that. It's a question for history that this offense right, recalls prior offenses, right? and that these offenses themselves are not just left at the level of attitudes, but that they have material, I called it also corporeal, but let me stick with material consequences. Um, one comparison, um, is that if you haven't seen, as I was talking to Mark, an excellent film that I hope maybe you could suggest to the people intervening in this, is a film called, called In Whose Honor. Anybody seen it? Okay, two. So In Whose Honor is a great film, I think it's from the 90s, um, about the case of University of Illinois. Chief Illini. Chief, uh, University of Illinois is uh, the fighting Illinois, right? And they have a mascot, and Indian mascots, right? The mascot for our national team, the Washington Redskins, right? Um, she fought against Chief Alinawick, who is the mascot of the University of Illinois, as insensitive, right, to Native Americans, 
And the entire movie, the folks who supported Chief Alainiwe were yelling into her face. And she faced, she faced backlash, violence, threats to herself and to her children, right? So there are material consequences to this. And they were telling her throughout the film, we honor you. The irony of yelling into somebody's face, we honor you. Well, pardon me if I don't feel honored, right? And so the title is so powerful, In Who's Honor, right? In Who's Honor. But the point of the film is it connects it back to, right? What some people in the film call the project of genocide. Right? And so this cultural, culturally insensitive moment that you had on Monday, I think is a constant reminder, right? To folks who are targets of this. Right? That it's not just insensitive, but the point of the movie also is that we can do this to you because we can. Right? We can do this to you because we can. Right? And so and you have nothing to do with that. The silver lining of that whole story is that it started a, 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 a national movement against using Indian mascots. And so it did grab a hold of the nation's imaginary, and certain, like, certain teams would not play with Illinois at that point. Certain college teams who refused to do that. But I think you know you couldn't just freeze it there because you have to continue the analysis because you could create a mark what Mark and I were talking about, which is the alibi, right? That the fighting Illini folks are really the racist, whereas the folks who are not gonna use Indian mascots anymore are good ones and they're not racist themselves. I think racism is much more complicated than that. And the idea of pointing to the cheerleaders on Monday as the racist, the problem, I think is going to be limited. Yeah. Well, I'd just like to make a couple comments on that too. Um, but I actually have a question. Um, in looking at the um, various inquiries that are done regarding the indigenous white relations, so for example, uh, the freezing deaths in Saskatoon, some of you are aware of that, and the Stone Child Inquiry, that was an investigation into the freezing death of a 17-year-old First Nations in Saskatoon that followed the deaths of a couple of other uh, First Nations men. Well, one of the recommendations of that uh, uh, study, inquiry, was uh, cross-cultural training for the police service. Yeah. And I look at that and I think, really? Like, all those, those three men who were found frozen to death all spoke English. And that they did not want to be taken to the edge of town and left there without their jackets or shoes to freeze to death. I'm just curious how that becomes cast as one of cultural misunderstanding. And that happens a lot in, in the Canadian context. So that's just, but I wanted to ask you a question too. And that is, uh, I'm starting to hear this idea that uh, class trumps race. So we're in a context where we've kind of been doing anti-racism a little bit here and there, and um, and now it's it's yeah I guess it's partly the neoliberal uh, agenda and the divide between, the increasing divide between the rich and the poor. So how do you? Uh, how I love you this know? question. Yes. I was talking to Mark earlier, and I was trained under a Marxist. Right? Class Trump's race. Um, and it's not, I, I would agree with you that neoliberalism and the economic crisis worsens that and makes that phrase, class Trump's race, have more purchase because we're, everyone of all colors, of all races, uh, is feeling the, you know, the tightening of the economy. I, my analysis, my work in, in writing looks at capitalism as a partner in crime with racism. And the way I prefer to think of it, right, is that capitalism is the material form that racism takes for us because we live in that context. And so I've actually went on, um, but a purely class-based analysis and it's associated language, such as labor exploitation, commodification, and all those words we know with Marxism, I think forgets the sub 
the subperson status of people of color, according to the racial contract. And it doesn't get to that, right? So that it would have been enough to exploit people of color under the regime of capitalism, but even within that regime, you know, the, the, the notion is that white workers are at least assumed to be persons. But the moment you deem a group of people as subpersons, certain kind of certain kinds of violence are allowed to be visited upon them. That is not allowed to an otherwise exploited other group of whites. Right? And so there are certain things about a class-based analysis that misses the point of who is a person within even the theories that Marx helps me think through. But at the same time, the whole language of you know, racial discrimination just falls by the wayside and gets um, disregarded as what's called a reflex of the economy as a, as a secondary effect of the economy so that race itself is looked at as a byproduct of capitalism, right? But the problem is we know that race transcends capitalism because they have race in, in, in Cuba, right? And so the, 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 no, the notion there is what's, what's communist racism like, right? So I think we have to think about ways that racism partners up with certain modes of production such as capitalism and communism or socialism as you have here and how that looks differently for you and me, for example. So the class trumps race, I haven't been compelled by that and I haven't, I haven't been convinced by that. I think one of the essays, either Mark or the dean um, recited was this essay I had called The Unhappy Marriage right, between Marxism. Luckily that precludes divorce. It's, they're, they're, um, so they're not yet married is my point. Um, and so my point also is to have race scholars take seriously right, Marxist analysis so that it helps us understand racism within the context of capitalism. Because Marxism helps me understand that. You know? So I, yes, I, I find that a problem, the idea of class trumps race. And we only have to look to David Rodiger and other historians of labor who, are, who have a race consciousness, let me put that in, who have a race consciousness, to ask questions of how the white working class was made to begin with, right? And Rodiger, I can go on about him, but mainly he says that part of the creation of the white working class was to become anti-black in the US. Part of the ascendance of Irish, from Irish ethnicity to white raciality in the US is to be anti-black. You see what I mean? So the sense of groups becoming white, even white workers, is premised on a certain amount, I don't know what the threshold is, but a certain amount of being anti-black, anti-people of color, etc. And that is part of achieving whiteness, even as a worker, or women, etc. Et Maybe time for one or two more questions if uh, you make your way to the mic quickly. Thanks so much for your presentation. Um, there are two, just two things that I'd like to say, and one that, that I'd like to offer, and that is about um, the notion of ignorance. The notion of, the notion of ignorance. I don't know if I heard that. Ignorance. It might be ignorance. Ignorance. Yeah. The notion of ignorance, and the way that um, you, I mean, that was a, a really interesting thing that the ignorance is not those things that you listed up there. I mean, that, that's a kind of innocence that yes. belies ignorance. And I just want to mention, um, and you probably know this, but I'd like to share it, but um, Shoshana Feldman writes about ignorance and knowledge, and she says that they're not opposites, and, but that ignorance is actually a willful act, and it is the willingness to ignore. Sure. And I, I, just, that, I just find that very useful when I'm thinking about those things. Sure. But, the question I want to raise about um, about whiteness as a white person is the way that it becomes a, in doing anti-racist work. There is a seduction that 
white analysis offers to white people that we actually get to talk about ourselves even more. <laughs> and, and become even more painful um, to ourselves and others around us. Yeah. And, and just how um, that's, that even while imagining that we're doing something oppositional, we could actually be reinforcing the problem and becoming part of it at all times. And in fact, there probably is no space when we're not part of the problem. But I would like to just ask you to comment about that, about that seduction. For sure. Um, I face the opposite, I suppose. Um, I joke that when I talk about whiteness studies, and let me just say that whiteness studies is a branding. It's a branding of sorts. So if people want to call me a whiteness study scholars, okay, I can go with that. If that makes you feel better, because it takes the edge off of calling me a scholar of white supremacy, for example, I can go with it. So I think whiteness studies has become an industry, and it does, in some ways, recenter white folks, right? Their experiences. Um, I do think we have choices about that. So for example, for me, the question isn't, are you doing whiteness studies, but what kind is it? Right? So I call it white whiteness studies. So are you doing white whiteness studies, or are you doing black whiteness studies? Right? So in some of the post-race discussions, which I've done some work in, you know, the rejection by some scholars of color isn't this discussion about post-race. The question is, what kind of post-race is it? Is it a white post-race? Is it a white post-racial understanding or a black post-racial understanding? Because some folks think that, you know, people of color have always entertained the idea of a post-racial society. I once talked to a colleague of mine from South Africa, and when I was trying to enter the post-race discussion, he says, "Oh, you should come to South Africa. We've been talking about that for a while." Right. So my question is, I mean, my point is that sure, I think. The recuperation of whiteness studies by white folks who enter it, right, they recuperate it to once again fold into white narcissism. Right? Enough about you. Enough about me. What do you think about me? <laughs> so enough about me. What do you think about me? Um, I think that is a real danger. And I think that the way I've come at that is to, I don't know if remind people is the right word for it, but Let's go with it. It's to remind people that even as they do anti-racist work, they're doing it from within racism. And the pretense of getting, this is a spatial analysis again, the, 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 the pretense of getting outside, right, spatially, right? And you can take spatially as being outside literally. Like, I'm not with those racists over there, I'm over here. Or you can even think of it discursively, right? Like, I'm at the margins discursively of whiteness. I think we have to remind people that the point is not being non-racist. Because I think a whole lot of white folks get caught up in that. Like the moment they get called out as racist, their whole world falls apart. But to me, the project is not trying to look non-racist. To me, the project is anti-racist. Right? Non-racist is some kind of identity that I think a lot of white folks seem to want to aspire to. Right? And when they get into that space that they think they're doing the I'm not religious, but they think they're doing the Lord's good work. Um, they get into this mentality that I'm going to that place of non-racism. But I think anti-racism is different from non-racism. Right? So that's how I would come at that. And I do see the danger of white folks doing this work, but there's always a danger, is the point you, I think you made. And that this danger is not specific to whiteness studies. So even in anti-racist work, which is not the same badge, white folks can still recenter themselves, right? So there's, there's the continual work that needs to be done with that. And please understand that people of color get tired of doing this to your shoulder and saying, you're doing it again, right? And so there's a kind of, you know, there's a kind of process. I call it, actually, I call it the schizoid white subject. Right? I call it the schizoid white subject. One who works to forget his or her whiteness because when whites think of themselves as white, they think they're better. So to forget one's whiteness 
and to remember one's whiteness. Because you are racialized in a context, your history precedes and follows you. So that's why I call it the schizoid white subject. To remember, at the same time, to forget. Does that, does that make sense? To remember, because it does make a difference that you're white. But to not try to forget one's whiteness is to think you're better than people of color. And that happens over and over again. Seems like there's one more. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, I better take my jacket off for this one too. That's cool going on. Okay, I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions to make about how we can do harm reduction, especially in educational institutions. Seems to me that's the best we can do because there have been centuries of colonialism. Um, I mean, clearly the fact that the majority of people in North America are white is clear evidence of that. And I mean, I teach English, which is culturally specific, like any language. Um, and sometimes I'm told things like, the official language of Saskatchewan should be Cree. And I say that's a logical statement. I've also heard, you know, all white people in North America should climb back onto the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria and go back where they came from. And I say that's logical too. We all know it's not going to happen. So what would be, do you think, a logical response to that statement like that? But you should go back to where you came from? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any one of us could get on a plane and go back to where our ancestors came from, but it's probably not going to happen on that. Yeah. That's, that's a great question. Um, part of me hesitates the move to replicate whiteness, right? and just say we should go back, because that's what we're told all the time, we should go back. Yeah. So part of me hesitates that that should be our move, but I can understand the temptation to do that, you know, to get away from the harm, to get away from the, um, the effects of it. Um, I think part of it is to practice in education, practice a, a, a certain critical self-reflection about what you've become by accepting the racial contract, right? To ask certain questions about what you think are normal and what are normative, and to, to think sometimes from the perspective of the other, or at least, you know what it is? Partly by not taking center stage all the time. That's, that's one thing I've noticed, is that, you know, you know I, I joke that it only takes one white in a group of 100 to take over, you know? Because the voice of whiteness the minute it's uttered, it's, it's, it's already, already has this history that flanks it and that, that gives it wind, you know? And so I think sometimes white folks have a hard time just not being centered, right? And, and to just, and to not be the smart one. You know, so I've, I've written, some of you may have read Smartness is Property. It's an homage to whiteness is property by Cheryl Harris. You know, so that notion of being the smart one, of the knower, because some of the stuff I didn't talk about is, like the epistemological subcontract is about who knows. Like who's the knower, who's assumed to know, as opposed to who's, who's a believer. You know? So I think part of, in, in, in terms of practice in education, of, of, of being, kind of taking the pulse, like taking the racial pulse of the room, and, you know, being satisfied to not be the center all the time. That's one, and yet, that's not enough, because to not participate is also infantilizing the people of color, right? So I think there's the sense of how to find a sweet spot in participation in dialogues that are that sort of classrooms. So not to take over, not to be the smart one, and also, not com being completely silent because I think that notion that, oh, you're right, you're right, I mean, how we sometimes say that is you're right because you're a person of color. I think that's, that's, that can be offensive too and insulting and infantilizing, such as when you get into a fight with your partner, right, and you're yelling at them and say something deep, you think, and they say, yes, you're completely right. There's something kind of disarming about that, right? And so pedagogically, like for example, I'm. Sounds funny, but I'm a man. And when I teach, 
and I am trying to engage women students, I, I do try to think about that, right? Um, of when appropriate, even performing criticism or asking them to think about certain things, right? That then allows me to participate as a thinking human in the situation. As far as, yeah, all the other stuff, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of education, which you might be able to do. I've written about it, it's a piece called Pedagogy of Fear, some of you have read. Um, the notion, for example, how when we talk about race in public places, we like to talk about it in safe spaces. Right? Let's have a safe race discussion. Right? And I've thought about that for probably 20 years, and then I wrote about it recently. And I took Fanon, my co-author, and I took Fanon's Wretched of the Earth and A Theory of Violence. We suggested that, that those clauses that we should have a safe space for talking about race, first of all, is a form of violence to people of color, a continuing violence, right? Because often when race dialogue is safe, it's safe for whites, and it's often um, limiting for people of color. Um, also, that a safe race discussion is out of sync with race relations. Yeah, <laughs> in a way, I suppose. But race relations is a very volatile, conflictual, right, social relationship. And to take away that contradiction and tension to make it safe, you're out of sync with your own topic. So. I think Patrick will come up and... I don't have a question. Oh. Ah. I've been assigned the task. <laughs> uh, usually when folks come, uh, we give them U of R swag and everything like that, um, but I decided to uh, go out and get you something that's decidedly more in Saskatchewan than either my work t-shirt. Nice. Not quite as nice as mine. <laughs> Zeus will be joining.